Hi, today we're going to be deriving the Euler-Poisson equations. These are a generalization of the Euler-Lagrange equations, and what they do is optimize a functional of this form, the integral from x1 to x2 of a function of x, y, y prime, and all the way up to the nth derivative of y. As you may already know, for the Euler-Lagrange equations, the functional stops at y prime. If you haven't seen the derivation for the Euler-Lagrange equation specifically before, I've linked the post in the description that shows that. This, however, is the generalization, and the idea used is somewhat similar. What we first do is, well, we consider our situation. We have two points, uh, x1, y1, and x2, y2, and suppose we have an optimal path y between them. It's a continuous function differentiable to between the two points. What we will then do is consider a variation in y, y hat, which could be y plus some function eta of x. But we also want to be able to scale our variation. So a variation like this could look like something like this, maybe. But what I'll do is add an epsilon next to the eta of x to scale my variation. So now it could be something of this form, or I could let epsilon equal to zero as well, and that would give me the optimal path itself. What we will do now is to consider the functional and replace y with y hat here. So let's just consider the functional j of f, the integral from x1 to x2 of f of x y hat, y hat prime dot 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 all the way up to the nth derivative of y hat. Now, we know that j of f is, well, it's a function of, uh, you see all of these parameters clearly, but it's also a function of y hat. And well, we know that y hat is a function of x, of course, y is a function of x and eta is a function of x, but also a function of epsilon because we can vary our epsilon. And well, when epsilon equals to zero, that's when we have the optimizing function, as we've said before. So if we were to consider j of f as a function of epsilon, according to normal calculus rules, we would have the derivative of j with respect to epsilon. It would be at epsilon equals to zero, it would be zero because, well, it's a turning point because at epsilon equals to zero, we have y hat equals y, which is the optimizer for this functional. But what is the derivative of j of f with respect to epsilon? Well, according to the chain rule, we can write this out. That would be, let's just write out the derivative of j with respect to epsilon. That would be the derivative of f with respect to x times, well, the derivative of the parameter with respect to epsilon. That's just how the chain rule works. And then you do it for each parameter. So it would be derivative of y hat with respect to epsilon dot 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 all the way up to the derivative of f with respect to y hat, its nth derivative of y hat, sorry, times the derivative of y hat's nth derivative with respect to epsilon. Sounds like a mouthful, but we can simplify this. First off, we know x is not a function of epsilon, so well, this is just zero. Uh, what about this right here, what if we can simplify any of this? Let's see. Uh, I know that y hat equals to y plus epsilon times eta of x. And so if I were to differentiate with respect to epsilon, that would mean that uh, partial y over partial epsilon equals to, well, this is not related to epsilon, so this is, this is gonna vanish, and you're gonna have eta of x remaining here. So we know that this can be simplified to eta of x, but what about the higher orders? In general, we know that if I have y hat equal, we have y hat equals to y plus epsilon times eta of x, and if I differentiate this k times with respect to x, that would be the kth derivative of y hat equals to y's kth derivative as well, plus epsilon times the kth derivative of eta of x. And now if I were to differentiate this with respect to epsilon, that would give me 
uh, partial y hat scathe derivative over partial epsilon, this is going to vanish as usual, equals to eta of x taken at its kth derivative. So we can now simplify our expression and uh, of course, sorry, there's a, there's an integral from x1 to x2 missing, sorry about that, but we can now simplify our expression and let's go ahead and do so. We would then have dj over d epsilon equals to the integral from x1 to x2 of uh, that would be partial f times partial y hat times eta of x plus and then of course the general term so for k equals uh, 1 let's say that would mean partial f over partial y hat's first derivative or just y hat prime times eta prime of x and this continues up until the nth case that will be partial f over partial y hat taken at the nth derivative times uh, eta to the n sorry the nth derivative of eta of x dx now what we're going to do is well we're going to leave this as it is and for these next terms what we're going to do is consider integrating by parts term by term so let's let's consider the general case so let's say i have and i'm going to use the di method for integration by parts if you don't know what that is i've linked a video explaining it before but this is the standard technique of integration that i use so what i'm going to do is i'm going to differentiate the partial y partial f over partial y hat taken at the kth derivative and i'm going to integrate eta taken at the kth derivative of x so well of course integrating with respect to x that would be uh this right here and we know by integration by parts that we'd get a term as so partial f over partial y hat taken at the kth derivative time the k, th k minus 1 th derivative of eta of x evaluated at x1 x2 now here's a very important part we know that our variation of course must pass through the two points through the starting points x1 and x2 so it must be equal to y at those points and hence eta of x1 equals to eta of x2 which equals to zero but we will also use n minus 1 more conditions and uh, this is a condition that's standard in the calculus of variations these are called the boundary conditions we're going to say that the kth derivative of eta of x1 equals to the kth derivative of eta of x2 which equals to zero for k less than or equal to n minus one greater than or equal to zero so that means eta without any derivative simply eta of x1 and then also eta prime of x1 and also eta second prime and so on up until the n minus one th derivative these are our boundary conditions so let's employ this well we know that of course this would be zero because of again our boundary conditions so we can uh, sorry we can skip this and we can continue integrating by parts uh, the first derivative of this is going to be d over dx uh, partial f over partial y hat taken at the kth derivative now if i integrate this again that would be eta of uh, eta taken at the k minus 2 derivative and of course doing the same thing all over again i see that this is going to be zero as well so what's going to happen is i'm going to keep doing this and i'm going to keep keep repeatedly integrating and uh, using integration by parts until i'm left with eta of x on this side and well for that to have happened i must have integrated k times and so i must have also differentiated k times so i'll have the kth derivative of with respect to x of partial f over partial y hat taken at the kth derivative and of course we see that first we have plus then we have minus so of course uh, continuing the pattern this should be minus one to the k 
because we, we see at the first derivative we have a negative at the zeroth derivative we have a positive so at the kth derivative we have minus one to the power k and uh, well whatever comes here whatever comes here uh, it's gonna multiply like this and you're gonna have to evaluate eta of x at the boundary conditions and that's gonna be zero so we're simply gonna be left with that whole expression it's gonna be equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of minus 1 to the k the k is derivative with respect to x of partial f partial y hat taken as the k derivative times eta of x dx and of course this is going to be the simplified form of the integral of x1 from x2 of a general term like this. So a general term partial f over partial y hat taken at the kth derivative times eta to the k eta taken at the kth derivative of x dx. So putting this all together, doing this for each term, I'm going to get something like this. And doing it for all of these terms, we're going to put this all together and we're going to see that we get something like the derivative of j with respect to epsilon equals the integral from x1 to x2. There's going to be an eta of x in each one of these expressions, so I can just factor out the eta of x. And I'm going to be left now with df over uh, dy hat. And for the first one, it's going to be minus the first derivative of df over dy hat taken at the first derivative, or just simply dy hat prime. This is the case k equals 1 in our formula. And continuing this on and on, it's going to go up to the case where k equals n. So that would be minus 1 to the n, d, the nth derivative with respect to n of partial f over partial y hat taken at the nth derivative dx and of course this is all under a bracket because there's a term of eta of x in each one of these now here's the interesting part we know that at epsilon equals to zero this is equal to zero as well because this is the turning point but we also know that y hat equals to y plus epsilon eta of x so at epsilon equals to zero we have y hat equals to y so if we plugged in y for y hat in this whole functional, it would be equal to zero. So that would give us the integral from x1 to x2 of eta of x times this expression. I'm not going to write it again, but this expression times dx, of course, is equal to zero. And of course, our variation can't be zero. We want a non-zero variation. So what's inside the integrand is zero. And therefore, we have the Euler-Poisson equations, namely that df, uh, partial f over partial y minus the first derivative with respect to x of partial f over partial y prime plus the second derivative with respect to x of partial f over partial y prime prime on and on up until minus 1 to the n the nth derivative with respect to x of partial f over partial y at the nth derivative equals to 0. We can clearly see that for a functional that includes only goes up to only y prime all of this is not going to be necessary so we're going to be left with this equals to zero, and that's the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we see that this is actually a generalized form of the Euler-Lagrange equations. And in physics problems, you'll usually see the functional for stress functions, usually, of elastic beams. The functional goes up to uh, y prime prime sometimes, and that's about it, really. It doesn't go up to higher derivatives. However, a general formula is possible with the boundary conditions that for the first n minus 1 derivatives of eta of x at x1 and x2, it's equal to 0. This is taken from Mark Cott's book on uh, Introduction to Calculus of Variations. And if you enjoyed this proof, leave a like and make sure to subscribe.